Get the maximum possible value out of every trade route you send. Learn how to avoid a bug which can cause great scientists like Galileo to waste most of their value. Identify exactly which technologies other players have researched so that you always pick the right target. All of these tips and more will be covered in today's video guide for Civ 6 multiplayer with the Better Balance game mod. Let's set the scene first. The game we'll be drawing our examples from is one where we're playing as the Maori Civilization. Because we have tundra to our south and mountains blocking us into our west, we're stuck with room for only 8 good cities even after killing the city-state of Nazca. In a position like this, it's important to squeeze as much value out of our land as we possibly can. Let's get started. First up, trade route optimization. While in the early game we send all of our trade routes internally to our capital city, this isn't optimal forever. As we form alliances and approach the Diplomatic Service Civic, which unlocks the Whistle Bank and Policy card, we want to start sending trade routes to our allies instead. Our two allies in this game are Byzantium to our west and Germany to our north. So, which one do we want to send our trade routes to? The answer here is Germany. This is for two reasons. The first one is that Germany's Civ bonus allows them to build an extra district in every city upon unlocking the Guild Civic. As the yield of trade routes is based on the districts completed in the destination city, Germany is often an ideal partner for international trade routes. The second reason is that Germany is on the same coastline as us, allowing us to embark our traders across the water in order to gain substantially increased gold per turn. Here, on turn 54, we can see that we don't have any good options for sending a trade route from our capital city. By moving the trader to a coastal city which is closer to Germany, however, our trader is now close enough to be able to reach the most developed cities at the core of the German Empire, and is also able to embark across the water for extra gold. Furthermore, Ludwig has activated the effects of two great merchants in his capital, which further increase the gold yield of the trade route. It's important to note that traders can't embark until after you've researched either the celestial navigation or shipbuilding technology. However, in order to maintain our stellar reputation as a reliable ally in CPL, we'll want to send at least some of our traders to both of our allies. So, how do we get comparably good trade routes to Byzantium despite them not being on our coastline? To understand this, let's talk about the exact way in which trade route yields are calculated. First, the base yield of the trade route is calculated based on the districts at the destination. I've displayed the exact values of all of the district trade route yields on screen. We can see from this, for example, that a trade route to a city with a commercial hub, government plaza, and a campus will provide 8 gold and 1 science per turn. So far, this trade route isn't competitive with the trade routes we could send domestically. Next, an efficiency modifier is used to multiply the base gold yield of the trade route, up to 200%. The efficiency of a trade route is calculated as follows. 100% plus the number of efficiency points divided by the distance of the trade route capped at 200%. Efficiency points are gained by traveling over the following features. 2 points per water or canal tile, 2 points per railroad tile, and 15 points per mountain tunnel. In simple terms, in order to achieve the maximum efficiency on a trade route, we just need 50% of its length to be stretched over water or railroad tiles. Therefore, in order to achieve the same efficiency in our land trade routes as our sea trade routes, we just need to cover 50% of the distance between us and Byzantium in railroads. After efficiency is taken into account, modifiers such as alliances, policy cards, and the Reform the Coinage Golden Age dedication are applied at the end. The efficiency of the trade route only increases gold from the base yield and does not increase the gold from these extra sources. And that's all there is to it! See? Wasn't that simple? Before we go sending any trade routes to our allies, however, there's one last thing to note. New trade routes will automatically try to follow the path with the shortest movement cost to their destination. What this means is that they may end up ignoring efficiency boosting tiles, such as water, if there's another route with a lower overall movement cost. Therefore, in order to ensure our traders between coastal cities always travel over the water, we never want to send an international trade route from one of our coastal cities to an allies coastal city before unlocking the ability for traders to embark. 
If we do this, the trader will be forced to travel along land, where it will construct a road that could inadvertently redirect future trade routes away from the water, reducing their efficiency. Let's return to the topic of railroads, as there's more to these than just optimizing trade routes. In the Better Balance game mod, railroads are unlocked earlier than in the base game, at scientific theory instead of at steam power. The coal cost of constructing them has also been removed, making them far more accessible than before. Completing a railroad between two cities is an excellent source of error score at this stage of the game, granting 3 error score for the world's first railroad connection and 2 error score if it's merely the first in your empire. By pairing this with other achievable sources of error score, such as circumnavigating the globe, hitting a golden age for the renaissance era is a cakewalk. Now, let's move on to our next topic, optimizing the value of the great scientist Galileo. This seems simple at first. We move him to a spot which is adjacent to a ton of mountains, and then we activate his effect. However, if we're not careful, there's a fatal bug that's been around since the game's inception that can cause us to lose most of the scientist's value when doing this. Activating Galileo deletes all of our science overflow. We've discussed science overflow in previous videos, but here's a quick refresher. Whenever we research a new technology, any excess science we generate that turn, beyond what is necessary to complete that technology, goes into a little bank we call science overflow. This can stack infinitely, so long as we keep researching techs which cost less science than we make per turn. Whenever we research an expensive technology that costs more than we make per turn, the science overflow we've banked up is spent on that research. When playing a game with the game speed set to standard, science overflow generally only banks up a little bit of science when completing a tech, and then gets spent immediately on the following turn. When playing a game with the speed set to online, however, techs cost half as much science as on standard speed. Because of this, it's easy to wind up in a position in the mid-game where we can bank up a ton of overflow. Now, we return to Galileo. As mentioned earlier, when activating him, all of our science overflow is deleted, which is extremely wasteful. Therefore, in order to avoid wasting it, we want to spend all of it first. To do this, we first put Galileo on hold for a bit. Then, we start researching expensive technologies until we get to one which we can't complete in one turn. After we've spent a single turn researching it, we know that all of our accumulated science overflow has been completely spent, and we can safely activate Galileo without having to worry about any waste. There's one last trick, however. By holding the shift key, we can queue up multiple technologies in the tech tree before activating Galileo. In this example, we queue up square rigging, education, ironworking, gunpowder, and banking. Upon activating Galileo, the science he grants is instantly spent on all of these in the order we queued them up. Here, he finishes square rigging, education, ironworking, and most of gunpowder. We've successfully managed to maximize the value granted by this great scientist. One last thing to note is that every great scientist who grants an instant burst of science suffers from the same overflow deletion bug. Galileo is merely the earliest and most common offender. Now that we know how to optimize our great scientist usage, let's talk about how to optimize our great writer, artist, and musician usage. Don't worry, this trick's not nearly as complicated as the previous one. When recruiting one of these great people, it's common for them to end up on the opposite side of the empire from the nearest open great work slot. A common mistake players often make is moving the great person to the city with the open great work slot, which takes a turn to do. However, it's actually possible to activate the great person a turn earlier by instead moving the great works themselves. It's a small optimization, but it's an optimization nonetheless. Furthermore, when moving great works around, one must remember that a great work is not always worth the same amount in every city. In the Better Balance game mod, the governor Moksha grants 15% extra culture to the city he's established in. This means that, when moving great works around, it's best to make sure that Moksha's city is filled first. Next on the chopping block, let's talk about zoos and aquariums. These are some of the most overlooked buildings by newer players, even though they're actually quite strong. Reaching an amenity breakpoint, such as plus 3 amenities for happy or plus 5 for ecstatic, grants an enormous amount of extra yields to our cities. 
optimal zoo and aquarium placement can be key in this, as these buildings grant their amenities to cities in a large area of effect. This area is 6 tiles for zoos and 9 tiles for aquariums. Here, we can see that our entertainment complex is in range of 6 cities, and our water park is in range of 8 cities. Between the two of these, all of our cities which would merely be happy are instead pushed to ecstatic for a huge 8% multiplier on all non-food yields. As a bonus, they're also placed to maximize the secondary effects of the buildings. Zoos grant plus one science on all rainforest tiles in a city, and aquariums grant plus one science on each coastal resource and reef in a city. Just look at the yields in these cities. For the last tip of this video, let's step back and take a close look at the state of the game. We're still stuck with very little room for good cities, and if we just stay put in the corner here, we stand no chance of winning the game. Killing another player seems like our best option, but our only neighbors are our two allies. However, as we're playing Maori, we gain plus two movement on all embarked units, and for even more speed, we've built the Great Lighthouse for an additional plus one. The obvious choice here is to sail some units across the sea, but how do we know who to target? The answer? Whoever won't have the steel technology when we arrive. Steel instantly grants walls to every city in a Civ's empire when researched, and these walls are tough. Our plan revolves around killing a coastal city with ironclads, moving in a ton of industrial era and renaissance era unit pre-builds, and upgrading them into modern era units on arrival. However, if a city has steel walls, ironclads won't be sufficient to capture it, and we'd have to delay our push several turns as a result. So, how can we tell how close a player is to unlocking steel? There are three sources of information that we need to piece together in order to determine this. The first is the total number of technologies the player has completed. We can check this by going to the world ranking screen and hovering over players under the science victory tab. Useful, but on its own, it doesn't tell us much. The second source of information is at the bottom of the tech tree. We can see little icons that tell us what the most advanced technology each sieve has researched is. Hovering the little numbered circles tells us which sieve they correspond to. Here, we can see that Persia's most advanced technology is from the industrial era. The last piece of the puzzle comes from examining the land of another player. Certain technologies have dead giveaways when they're completed. For instance, industrialization grants plus one production on all mines, ballistics grants plus one production on all lumber mills in the Better Balance game mod, and flight grants access to aerodromes. And speak of the devil, Persia just unlocked flight! Piecing it all together, based on the number of techs Persia has completed, their signs per turn, where they were in the tech tree a few turns ago, and the specific techs they've finished, we know that we have time to sail our army across before Persia can finish the steel technology. Thanks to this, we're able to easily capture their one coastal city with some ironclads, and use it as the staging ground for upgrading all of our units to tanks, artillery, and helicopters the moment we unlock the prerequisite techs. This results in a crushing victory against an unprepared opponent. That's all for today's video. Remember to subscribe to catch future videos, and leave a comment about what you'd like to see next. If you want to catch me streaming full games of Civ 6 Multiplayer Live, be sure to check out my Twitch channel which I've linked in the description below. Herson, signing out.